Thanks for coming to this session. Uh, I'm Herbert van der Sompel and I'm here with Martin Klein, who's in the back, who's on my team in uh, uh, Los Alamos. So we're going to brief you today on uh, initial thinking and results of the Hyperlink uh, project. <coughs> Hyperlink is a project in which uh, we have uh, people from the research library uh, at the Los Alamos National Laboratory. Uh, so that's Martin, that's Robert Sanderson, who unfortunately could not make it uh, today, and myself. And then we have people at the University of Edinburgh. There's a, the Adina group, uh, which you may know, uh, they are providing a lot of uh, electronic information services to higher education uh, in the UK. And they're part of uh, this project. And then we have people at the language technology group. Uh, that's part of the renowned informatics department at the University of Edinburgh. And all of uh, this is funded by the Andrew Mellon Foundation. <coughs> We'd like to give a couple of, no of uh, acknowledgements to people and institutions uh, that are supporting us in this work, other than uh, the funding agencies, uh, people that provide us with primary data sets and secondary data sets uh, that we can leverage as part of uh, this work. And then also groups that help us with uh, technology, uh, such as uh, Crossref, uh, Jeff Wilder, uh, people at Elsevier, and then people that we liaise with, so exchange ideas with. There's also Microsoft, uh, from which we got the uh, academic uh, collection. Uh, several groups that we liaise with, um, people at PermaCC, uh, Michael Nelson and his group at Old Dominion University, Crossref, Internet Archive, uh, and so on. So the project is all about uh, reference rot. And so the problem domain really is web-based scholarly communication and how it links to resources uh, on the web. It references uh, web resources. And there's really roughly two types of these references. One is for formal citation of other uh, scholarly works. And basically we've seen that ever since the introduction of electronic journals, uh, as soon as they arose, we saw links popping up next to citations, right? And then there's also uh, this notion of just referencing resources in, I'm going to call it the web at large uh, from now on. It's just things that we are not considering to be maybe at the core of the scholarly communication system. It's uh, project websites, software, ontologies, workflows, online debates, all these kind of things that are created or used as part of uh, scholarship. <clears throat> and then, as we know, I do not need to tell you that, that links to web resources are fragile. And we've introduced a term, actually, as part of this project, uh, that is reference rot. Uh, and reference rot refers to two things. One is link rot, which is very well known. And that's the fact that a link will break, and you will get a 404. And the other is content decay, which basically means that content on the web changes over time. And when you reference a URI, let's say, three years ago, the content that will be there today it may very well be no longer representative of what used to be there. Okay? So you're basically referencing something, but by the time someone consumes the reference, the content is really gone. And so the combination of these two, we have termed a reference rot. So I came up with a little table to characterize uh, this problem space where in the rows you see link rot and content decay. So as the problem areas, both of which together are a reference rot, and then broadly it is divided between the nature of resources that are referenced. So on the one hand scholarly resources and on the other hand uh, web at large resources. Now believe me I understand that this is not a real line between those two and actually increasingly that line gets blurry as much more informal uh, scholarship occurs on the web. So this whole line between formal and informal is blurring and that's actually where this line here uh, uh, is to be situated a bit. So I'm going to look at the left hand side first. So this is you know, the real kind of scholarly resources. Let's just think about books and electronic articles uh, and all that. And so many years ago, in order to address the link problem, we've introduced DOIs 
and the HTTP version of the UIs to actually make those actionable. And they solve the problem of, well, when content moves from one place to another on the web, so it gets a different URI, then your DUI uh, URI will still you know, redirect to the appropriate uh, location. When it comes to content decay, one is to say that the problem is a bit less there than in the other part of the table because we're typically dealing with content that has a sense of fixity to it. We are used to journal articles somehow being frozen and books somehow being frozen. Okay, there might be a new version a couple months later and so on, but it is definitely not as dynamic as regular uh, web resources. And still, even though we have uh, rather fixed content, it could still disappear. And hence, our community has set up all these kind of specialized frameworks to deal with scholarly communication and the archiving of it. Things like uh, clocks and locks, portico at the level of the primary archiving, the archiving of the primary literature, and then things like the keepers registry to try and figure out what is being archived uh, where. It looks like all of this is nicely under control. And as a matter of fact, that's not really true. Uh, you've heard Cliff uh, reference it. There was a session just next door uh, earlier. And David Rosenthal has a fantastic blog post about how this thing that we think is under control actually is not all that much. And there's quite some interesting issues there. Nevertheless, this is not what the hyperlink project focuses on. We are looking at this part of the table. So we're looking at the link rot and content decay problem you know, at the level of resources at uh, the web at large. And so here we have this consideration that I alluded to already before, that the type of resources we're dealing with here may not have that sense of fixity like we are used to in typical scholarly communication, but also they are not necessarily under the custodianship of people that actually really care about persistence and long-term access. You know, they may just be out there and we are using them and no one cares as a custodian that, you know, yeah, we should do something about that. We need to preserve that. So quite a difference with stuff that is at the core of uh, the scholarly record. The problem is that when we reference these kind of materials and they vanish or change over time, we basically have a broken scholarly record, right? You cannot follow the reference anymore at some later point in time to see what actually the reference material uh, really was. And so when you think about really transforming scholarly communication to web-based environment, then a lot more materials will be in the right-hand side of the column, and hence it's really a problem that we're going to have to start solving. Some of you may have been uh, in the audience when I did my plenary presentation in San Antonio uh, at CNI. I use this article here as an example of what happens with references to resources uh, in the web at large. Uh, this is a paper I wrote in 2004. It's about uh, nine years old now. And just in this list, and I'm not going to go through it in any detail this time, but just in this list of references, you see all the kind of combinations that can happen. Like this URI here still does no longer exist, but it is archived. Same with this one. This one no longer exists, it's archived, no longer exists, not archived at all. So we don't even have a trace of this uh, thing anymore in any of the web archives. Okay. This just to illustrate that the problem is real and needs some kind of uh, solution. The hyperlink project works in two strands with regard to this problem. There's a research strand where we try to quantify uh, the problem. And this is the part that actually Martin uh, will talk about. And then there's another strand where we are thinking, brainstorming, and hoping to find, I won't say solutions to the link rot problem, but at least components that may help ameliorate uh, the problem. We are not as arrogant as saying we're going to solve this problem. We're trying to find things uh, that may help. Um, in the research part, we are focusing on electronic journals because those are corpora that we can easily uh, put our hands on and start working with. 
hand over to the people in Edinburgh in the language technology group to do the, uh, have them do the beta mining. But again, if you have seen my presentation in San Antonio, or if you care about looking at the video, you will know that we have a bigger picture in mind. It's not at all only about electronic journals. It's really about web-based scholarly communication in general. And all these assets that are used in scholarly communication that live over the web are dynamic, change over time, and are interdependent. And that somehow we need to be able to preserve slices, temporal slices of what is going on there to be able to revisit the state of the scholarly communication system at certain moments uh, in time. Is it worth our time and is it worth Mellon's money to study this problem? Well, this little uh, graph and this shows how articles increasingly link to web resources. And with web resources, again, I mean web at large resources. These are not links to things with DOIs. These are links to stuff out there. And what we see is a plot based on URIs extracted from PubMed Central papers. This is the time real 1997 to 2012 that is being depicted here, where you see from hardly any reference at all in 1997 to over 140,000 references to web resources only in that corpus in 2012. So if you believe that these kind of resources are subject to the same kind of problems of reference rot as all the rest on the web, then we do have a problem that needs to be solved. And then if that still doesn't convince you, the New York Times actually cares. So if that isn't an argument, okay? The New York Times uh, ran this story here which is actually, it was uh, written because uh, Jonathan uh, Zittrain and his colleagues at Harvard had put out a new study about link rot and reference rot in which they basically observed that the problem in legal journals was actually very severe, but that it's not restricted to scholarly literature. You also find it in Supreme Court decisions where links do not work anymore or where the material at the end of the link has changed over time. I'm emphasizing this because this is not just a problem of scholarship. This is a problem in the legal domain. This is also a significant problem in Wikipedia, for example, where they have a special project that the Internet Archive is involved in to actually try and address uh, this uh, reference rot issue. That was the introduction to it all. Martin is now going to talk about the research bit of the project, and I'll be back then to talk about how we're going to solve all of this. Right. Thanks, Herbert. So I have the honor now to give you um, a brief insight into preliminary results that we have um, extracted from our first few experiments. And um, uh, I get to show you some pretty graphs, which is always good, right? So Herbert mentioned it, I'm sure everyone is aware of this. The problem of, of reference rot in the link rot is not a new problem. It, is, it has been studied in the lab uh, for scholarly communication even, and also for government documents as we've just seen. Um, so everyone is probably aware of these uh, uh, scholarly papers that tell you about the dynamics of the web and links rot, but the reporting shocking numbers of uh, high percentages of links that are gone by now. Um, however, what Hyperlink does differently in this context is that we're um, uh, both investigating not only link rot, but also reference rot, so basically the decay of content over time that was mentioned before. So that's a new, one new angle of the project compared to the previous uh, link rot studies that we've seen. Um, we also are able, we are in a unique position to have great insight into what actually is archived of uh, uh, resources that are being linked to. So that's another angle that we are fortunate to, uh, to have. And uh, all everyone's bragging that their data set is larger than everyone else's, right? But we're really uh, uh, in a position that we can uh, run this experiment at an unprecedented scale on several dimensions. First dimension is the number of articles that we look at. Uh, the second is, I mentioned, the number of uh, uh, resource, uh, I'm sorry, archived resources that we can look at. That's a unique situation that we are in at uh, Atlanta. And um, 
and of course, with the number of articles uh, um, uh, hand in hand goes the number of uh, URIs that you can actually look at. So these three columns basically are uh, are unique to to our setup. To prove what I just said, a uh, little table. Details don't matter in this case. What I want you, uh, what I would like you to point out is the last line, which is a pilot study that we have done uh, more than two years ago, and that already shows you in terms of uh, number of articles roughly estimated by the uh, uh, time span of publications that we're using, we are well above everyone else that we are aware of. Uh, the number of URIs that we looked at, we are well above everyone else thus far. And uh, our, what we're particularly proud of, uh, the number of URIs that we can actually look up in that archives, uh, we are well above everyone else. So that gives you an idea of, uh, we're not only you know, rerunning experiments that others did, we're really having several uh, dimensions that are uh, entirely new to the domain. Right. So this is the methodology that I'd like to go over briefly now, um, just as an overview. This is uh, uh, where we're going, and I'll start in the zoom in a little bit. Start in the left top corner uh, and uh, walk you through our uh, methodology. Right? So we generate or we, we obtain several corpora um, containing scholarly articles. Clearly, that is the first step. We extract the, uh, uh, all your rice from those articles. Obvious second step which leads, leaves us with a list of URIs and a little bit of metadata um, about uh, uh, surrounding those URIs. For example, the, uh, the journal that the URI was uh, cited from, so the citing journal, basically, or the publication date of the article, fairly important right, for our uh, purposes. And then we do a little filtering. Um, basically, as Herbert mentioned, we're filtering out references to uh, scholarly work, so everything that has a DOI, for example and uh, your rise to resources of the web at large. Um, so to have those, the, the <coughs> distinction between the two. What we use, of course, for our experiment is the, uh, the, the set of, of your rise to uh, resources of the web at large. Um, and then a um, little bit more detail about the uh, right-hand part of the methodology. So we have our filtered your rise, we have our corpus of interest, and the metadata, publication date of the article, for example. And uh, we do a live lookup on the web today. What that means is we just send an uh, HTTP request against the resource and uh, see whether it's still there in very shallow terms. And if you're uh, familiar with HTTP as a protocol, basically if it returns something that starts with a 2, with a 200 uh, uh, status codes, we consider this URI as it exists. If not, it does not exist. So the distinction between the two for, the, for any given URI of interest. Exist, does not exist. Okay. Right. And then, and this comes back to what I mentioned before, our uh, a privileged situation that we are in, uh, we also use um, the, the, the set of URIs to look them up in the archive. We have um, the Memento framework available for us, to us, and that gives us a unique situation to look up archived holdings of resources uh, across several archives, across many archives worldwide. Right. So that's a situation that no one else that we're aware of is in, and thanks to Memento, to the framework, we're able to do that. So what we do in there by looking up whether a URI is archived or not, is as a first step, we obtain the time map of, uh, of any given URI. What that is, is basically a list, uh, and this list contains archived URIs to archived versions of any given URI, and that, uh, the uh, time when this archived version was created we call the Memento data. And of course, as a first test is to see whether this list is empty or not, meaning whether there are archived versions of a URI. If it's empty, of course, the URI is not archived. We can uh, do this as a first trivial test. And then the secondary test is to go through the Memento um, a time map and extract the Memento, the archived version of the URI that is time-wise closest to the publication date of the article. That, that is our approximation of best copy, best archive version of the URI. So once we have that extracted from the time map, we again send a request against this uh, uh, memento and see whether it exists or does not exist. And in this case, then it's whether it's archived or not archived. Right? So we have four cases for any given URI. It's either it either exists today, it does not exist today, it is archived, or it's not archived. Right? So that distinction is important because the next few uh, graphs I'm going to show you uh, distinguish this. 
Right. To come back to the overview of the methodology, of course, these are the components that we're using for our experiment. Right. I promised you pretty graphs, um, and I'll deliver. But first, some uh, 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 bragging data. Right? So the amount of articles that we process in the early in this early stage of the experiment is uh, almost 500,000 articles. Uh, we used the PubMed Central Corpus, as Herbert has already uh, indicated, from the beginning of 1997 all the way to the end of 2012. Uh, the number, oh, almost uh, around about 30 percent of the articles do contain links of uh, that are in, of interest to us. So links to resources at the web online. Right? Um, the total number of resources uh, of, of links, rather of references, is uh, uh, about 500,000. And uh, if you dedupe this, you get a few uh, uh, less than that, of course, which just indicates that uh, uh, there are your rights that are referenced multiple times. Okay. So this pie chart um, gives you two messages. The first one is there's good news and there's bad news. And the good news is that 31% of the URIs that we've uh, checked, basically, do exist. And they're, they're, and they're archived. This is clearly the best case scenario, right? Um, the light greenish uh, slice of the pie, it's okay, but it's, it's still, it's, it's not perfect because the URI does not exist on the live web today anymore, but at least it's archived. So everything that's somewhat green on this pie is still good news. Right? Everything that's not green is not good news because either it doesn't exist or it is not archived. Right, so the red one, for example, where both cases are true, this is truly bad news. So that's the first message. Um, the second message is, um, I need to put this in more uh, liberal or in more, more relative terms because the, the plot is a little bit deceiving. What it does not show you is the case that I published, or I wrote and published an article in 2011. I included a reference to a web resource and the only archived version of that web resource is from 2001. Right, so, as I mentioned, right, the, 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 uh, uh, the proximity time-wise is not great, so hence the likelihood that the, uh, uh, the archived copy with the light copy at the time I wrote the article are disjoint is, uh, is fairly high. So we tried to approach this, uh, this, this plot from a different angle and, and said, okay, if we narrow our definition of archived time-wise and say archived is only that URI that has been archived within 30 days of publication date. What would this pie look like then? Well, here's the answer. The good news, from the bad news, has uh, numerically increased. So now we only have a total of 22% good news and everything else is bad news. So if you're now even more restrictive, so like, you know, if I uh, write an article on, the, on November 30th, and the earliest copy I find is November 1st, well, maybe there's still too much uh, time that has passed. Um, let's look at the time span of 14 or 15 days. The bad news, I great, right? So now we have only 15% good news. And you can play this game further. <laughs> Seven days, one day. And one day, especially, uh, there's no good news left. Right. So we could have animated that. Right. So the, uh, the point there is, uh, um, if you're looking at a, uh, um, at a URI that is archived within the same day of publication of the article, uh, you're basically out of luck. Right. This is one of the plots that you will see in all kinds of uh, the web is dynamic and uh, uh, links rot and those kind of things uh, studies. So the amount in relative terms, the uh, amount of your um, rights that are not existent today anymore in relative terms. Meaning, uh, in 1997, uh, more than 80, 85 percent of resources that have um, linked are gone today. So that's clearly bad news. And uh, bear in mind that the amount of articles that have been published since then are probably increasing as well. So 30% in 2012 is still very, very bad news. So 30% of resources of, of, of your rights linked to from scholarly articles in, in last year are gone today. Right. If we overlay that 
line, you recognize the, the black line has not changed. It's still the same black line. <coughs> we uh, plot that together in the same canvas with resources that have been archived. The blue line shows you all your rights that are archived relative, again, to all resources cited. Uh, that still gives you the, uh, the confirmation that uh, we have work to do. Right? We're not we're far from, from done in terms of what we need to archive. Um, and again, there's clearly some noise in the early years uh, where the lines uh, in, in the more recent past. And uh, the distinction between the time that has passed between publication of an article, citation of a URI, and uh, uh, archival time, we narrow it down all the way down to one day, which is represented by the red line. You, you follow that it's really bad news. So there's two things that we'll, I think we can take away from this graph. One is, uh, we need to do better in archiving, clearly. And uh, two, if we can, or our ultimate goal would be to raise not only all of the colored lines, but particularly the red line. Because that's presumably the archive, archived copy of a, of a resource that is closest to what the author intended to reference. Right? Because it has been archived within one day of publication. OK, so for this, I'll hand over to Herbert again, and uh, he'll talk over some, some possible solutions of the problem. Thanks a lot, Mark. Um, so this slide says solving reference fraud, although it should say ameliorating, <laughs> but it didn't fit on the slide in <laughs> that font size. So okay, my apologies for that. Again, we're not that arrogant. So we're coming back to um, this table uh, here. And I'm going to talk about the aspect of content decay only a tiny bit, and I'm going to focus most actually on uh, the link road uh, problem. So first of all, again, this observation that with this web at large content, we cannot count on the fact that there is any kind of fixity. So we are kind of down to we'll have to take snapshots of that content as it evolves over time if we do want to revisit the content by means uh, of references. Okay, so it's this bit uh, that I'm talking about. <coughs> and in essence, uh, the message here is somehow we'll need to do better at proactively taking snapshots of things that are being referenced or are likely to be referenced in uh, scholarly communication. And we can see two components uh, to a solution. First of all is at the level of those kind of resources where you think they may be subject to uh, referencing in scholarly communication. If you have a project website of a multi-million dollar project, then most likely you're going to get some references in papers. So how about you archive your stuff? Okay, so you do that either by running a content management system with a good versioning system so that you automatically have good snapshots over time, you run a beta wiki and so on. You subscribe to on-demand self-web archiving services like Archive.it or you run a transactional uh, web archive uh, like the side story solution that we created. So by which I mean that if you somehow are involved in scholarship yourself with your project, then there's a responsibility that you probably carry to make sure that your web presence uh, remains available over time also. And then for the rest, we can obviously web archive resources on demand. For example, the author, as he creates uh, or as she creates a manuscript, can you know archive things in these on-demand web archives. I think the Internet Archive just launched a service like that. We've had web citation in that real for quite a long time. There is Archivist. So there's quite a number of uh, offerings uh, in this reel. And then with the people at Edinburgh, uh, we're also brainstorming about intervening in the manuscript submission uh, process. For example, the manuscript is submis uh, submitted. At that point, you scan the submission for your eyes. You filter them out with well, DOI you don't have to worry about. It's all rosy there. So let's look at the others and let's archive uh, that stuff uh, proactively so that we have these snapshots as they were uh, intended, actually. That's basically the only thing I'm going to say about that. This is going to be explored further in future stages uh, of the project. 
And I actually want to, um, I want to focus uh, on this bit here, the link uh, rod bit. And this is an area in which I have been surprised myself of finding a problem that I was not aware of. And as you probably know, we've been working on Memento for four years. We think a lot about web archiving and so on. And suddenly a problem hit us related to referencing uh, archived resources. And I'm going to introduce it to you. So I'm coming back to the New York Times article here. And so here is a link to the study well, it's actually to the blog post that Jonathan Citrain did about uh, the study. So I don't know whether you see it in the back, but there's a URI behind that link here that points to a blog at the Law Library of Harvard. And so obviously, when I click this, I end up at the blog because, you know, there's no 404 there yet. It's still uh, live. Nothing surprising here. Now I take that URI. And I go to the Wayback Machine, and I search for the URI. And indeed, I find two copies, actually one from the day of publication of uh, the New York Times article, and then another two weeks uh, later or so. And I do the same thing. I go to archive.is, and I search the URI of the blog post. And indeed, I also find an archived copy. So all is good. There's a couple of archived copies of that blog post out there. Now I scroll down in this uh, uh, New York Times article. And down here, the article talks about the Perma CC uh, solution, which is one of these on-demand archiving approaches. So basically what happens, someone wants to preserve a snapshot of a certain web resource. You go in there, you submit to your URI, snapshot is taken, it's put in the archive, and in response, you get a new URI back, right? And that URI is what they now call a new permanent link to that archive thing. So behind this link here, the new permanent link, is actually the PERMA uh, CC kind of link. By the way, this is not at all about PERMA CC or anything wrong with PERMA CC. This is how all these services actually uh, behave. So we have a new URI here. And now we're going to do the same thing, right? We're going to click it, and we end up in Perma CC, where indeed you see the archived uh, snapshot. And now I'm going to the Internet Archive again, and I search that URI, and I don't find anything, although I know that the thing is archived there. And I go to archive.is, and I don't find anything, although I know because I've shown you earlier that it's archived there. So what happened here? Well, the good news was that we have another snapshot of that blog post in an archive. That's great. You know, we, we now have more and more is good. You know, lots of copies keep stuff safe and all that. The bad news is that by using that new URI there, we've actually undermined the possibility of finding a, an archive copy of that thing in other web archives. Okay? Basically, why was that? Because we have replaced the original URI, the URI of the blog post, with the URI that was given to us by a web archive. And so basically, we've painted us in the corner. Because now, access to that copy, by putting that URI of that archived copy in there, in the link, we are now 100% dependent on the permanent existence of that one archive to be able to access that archived copy. I can no longer use that URI to find it in any of these other archives. So basically, I've replaced one link rod problem with another. Just to illustrate that even web archives may not be forever, and that this is really a problem that we should care about. Here's a snapshot of websitation.org, which actually was the first, as far as I know, to be in this game of archiving web resources used in scholarly communication. It's been around for many years, and at one point earlier this year, announced that it was running out of money, 
and it started a fundraiser, initially asking for $50,000 to continue its services, then decreasing to 25,000. And last time we looked, they only had made 12,000 or so, and we do not know what the current situation is. Problem, I think you get it. Even these kind of organizations you know, suffer of the same kind of constraints of many others. Here's another instance of the problem. This is a blog post I wrote with uh, Michael Nelson from Old Dominion at the occasion of the Conservative Party in the UK taking down basically a large portion of its website to hide the speeches of Cameron. Because there were speeches about you know, new thinking about openness of government and how the internet was going to change all of that. And they're very embarrassed you know, now of ever having said any of that. So they just wanted to hide it. Now, obviously, there are copies of these things in web archives, right? And so the problem that this blog post start, uh, tries to reveal is that although the Internet Archive held copies of basically all of those speeches, because of a policy that the Internet Archive has, they were not able to show them to end users. The policy is a technical one. I do not need to go into any details. The point is here that these web archives are subject to policies, each archive subject to other policies, subject to other kind of legislations. Okay. So fortunately, during this period of time, other web archives had copies that were still accessible because they did not have exactly the same policies as the Internet Archive. Point I'm trying to make, you want multiple archives to, to leverage so that you know that at any moment in time you can at least recover something. Third thing, I'm sorry, it's again about the Internet Archive. Just to illustrate that disasters can happen. Nothing bad happened at all in this fire to the archival uh, capabilities at the Internet Archive. But just a reminder that all organizations are subject to disaster also. All of this to say that when we reference archived web materials, we need an approach where we can leverage all the web archives around the world, not just a single one. We should not paint ourselves in the corner and think that, well, this one is going to be there forever, so that's good. We cannot accept a stove uh, pipe kind of approach. Now, since the original URI, in the example here, the URI of the blog post at Harvard, is a key into all the web archives, my point here is that the way that we link to archive materials should necessarily also include that URI. So we should not throw the key away. When we link to that, we should actually uh, keep it. So we need two URIs. One is the original URI, and one is the URI of the memento of the archive copy. Now that's a problem, of course, right? Because a link, an anchor element in HTML, only allows for one URI. And hence, it's really understandable that the way we currently link to archive material is by means of the memento URI. It's totally understandable. I'm just trying to say it's not right. You know, there is something broken here in the infrastructure that I think is rather significant and that requires the attention of uh, this community. Basically, solving a link rot problem with an approach that itself is subject to link rot, that's probably not really great. So we have a proposal, and this is really a brainstorming kind of proposal. We are not claiming that we have the solution. But there's a document uh, out there that is called uh, the missing link uh, document. And basically we're saying, how about we extend the link? You know, so we add additional information uh, to the link to allow us to also go back into archives, go back uh, into time. And so extend the link to the original resource, so you keep the original uh, link in there with temporal context. URI of a memento, if you have one, and then several dates that you could actually use. The date of the page that contains the link. So if I would know the publication date of a paper, then I could actually use that also to say, hey, the author, this was published around that time, so probably I would like to look at that link as it was at that moment in time of publication. or at the finer granularity, the date of the link itself. 
And this is very similar to how we now formally cite website, right? Where we say access at a certain date. But here we are advocating to providing that information in a machine actionable way, you know, in the HTML, on the links and so on, so that machine agents can actually, and user agents can act on that information. This slide provides a summary of that proposal. And so basically here you see uh, a link element, right? The anchor, where the content of HREP still would refer to the original version, the original URI, so that at any moment in time you could keep following that. That is also the way that this resource is known throughout the web by means of its original URI. And then in addition to that, you introduce the notion of a version URL, so that's the memento URL, and a version date, the date of archiving, for example. With this here, you go to the current version of the resource. With the original URI and the version date, you could use a memento or a web API to go to a version of the resource with an unknown version URI. And with this version URL, you could go to, you know, for example, the permacy C copy. And then up here, this is actually from a schema.org, where you could use the publication date of the page, and again, use that under the memento protocol or under web API, web archive API, to access a certain archived copy. So the question here is, of course, how do you even make that happen, right? The approach that is currently taken, just put the URI of the memento in the link, works out of the box. That's why people have been doing it. But I hope I've shown you that there's a problem with doing it. We paint ourselves in the corner of uh, one archive. The proposal that we are making, which again is a conceptual kind of proposal, right, requires infrastructure change. But it does contribute, in general, to web persistence. So it does uh, something for us in the long term. So we need changes at the level of HTML and we need changes the browsers to actually leverage those kind of new attributes. And we need similar kind of changes in all kind of tools. There are possibilities to make that happen. And as a matter of fact, I found out that in 1995, the HTML actually had a special purpose attribute to deal with issues of web persistence. It allowed you to put a URN in there, you know, uh, this is now long gone, and actually HTML5 even emphasizes that this is deprecated and all that. And I'm kind of trying to come to the conclusion here that we should probably revise this and have a conversation uh, between our community and maybe you know, the web technical community to figure out what can be done uh, in this real. So basically that concludes uh, our presentation. We've gone, well, Martin has given you preliminary results of the research bit of Hyperlink. I've addressed our thinking about these problems, link crop and content decay, for references to uh, the web at large. And then I do have a little demonstration. So this is actually a demo by means of screenshot. I could do this live, but I've learned my lesson. <laughs> Right, so we're going to go back uh, to the New York Times article. Oh, a little plug for Memento, okay? We have a Memento for Chrome extension that's actually a real beauty. Please install it. And it's a shortened URI, so it's more like, you know, do as we say, not as we do. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but please tell your friends and family and colleagues about this because it's a true, it's really remarkably beautiful. Uh, anyhow. So we've created an experimental version of Memento for Chrome that can use all that temporal context that I talked about earlier to get to stuff. So this is again the New York Times article. First observation, the New York Times as many other venues actually already have this information in there, the publication date of uh, a news story. So we also found it in the Washington Post, for example. This is schema.org stuff. So that's already there. Nothing needs to be done here. 
remember this link here that was to the blog post, right? And we changed that to include that uh, temporal context. So I now have a link that in the href contains still that URI to the blog post, and it has now a special uh, attribute here, beta version URL, and that has the perma CC uh, link in it, okay? So I did that little editing manually, of course, just for the purpose of the demo. So I'm going to have to read this all for you because uh, you don't see it. The, the paradigm that the Memento extension for Chrome uses is you right click and then these temporal options become uh, available to you. So we right click on this link and here is the Memento uh, menu item now. And the first line that you see here is related to a user setting a calendar date. So that's always available. The user wants to see something at a certain uh, calendar date, you can select it there. But here, that also get near the current time. That will give you the most recently archived copy. We have get at page date, and we have get from Perma CC. Those are uh, new options that are available. So I think here I'm choosing uh, get near the current time. And there I only use the uh, original URI, and I find uh, a version, an archived version in archive.is. Uh, I'm going back, and here I'm now using the original URI and the daytime that was provided for the page, so the page publication date. This option says get that page date, and now we're using the Memento protocol with that date, and we end up at the version, that version that we saw before, uh, from the Internet Archive, exactly archived on the date uh, that I asked for. And then this option here, get from Perma CC, and that obviously uses that data version URL thing that we put in there. And when I select that, I'm going directly to the copy in Perma uh, CC. Remember that link that was basically overwritten with the Perma CC link? That was the only one here. Well, that's now exactly the same as before, right? As the prior link. It links directly to the URI, the original URI of the blog post, and in this attribute, it has the Perma CC thing. And so everything that you saw before is available here also. So now going to the blog post itself, there's some really interesting stuff here. So this page did not have the publication date as metadata, so I actually manually added it. And here, this is really cool. So there's a pointer here. Uh, it says, wiki discusses link rot here. So basically, it points into Wikipedia to the link rot uh, page, basically the topic about link rot. Now, see that this uh, page was published on September 22nd. And this was actually before Perma CC was really announced, or really uh, active. So I click, I obviously get, this is a regular click, I get the current version of that page, right? And I did this a couple, yeah, a couple of days ago. I scroll down, and you may not be able to read it, but there's an entry here that talks about Perma CC. The link was put in there prior to Perma CC actually really existing. I get the page that talks about Perma CC. And this is an example of forward content decay, you could say. This is not what the author saw, right? So here's what we're going to do now. I'm going back here, and now I'm going to follow this link subject to the publication date of the page. Remember the one I put in uh, a metadata tag. And now we're going, in this case, use the Memento protocol to use the original URI in Wikipedia for the topic and the page publication date, and we're actually going to arrive at the version of the Wikipedia page that was active at that very moment in time. So here we are. This is an old revision of the page. You know, 3 September, that was the one. It's an old version. And I scroll down, and now the Perma CC thing is not there. So basically, we are now seeing 
exactly what the author saw when uh, the author was referencing this. <coughs> One more little trick here. There's a link here to the Harvard Library Innovation Lab. And it's actually the force uh, behind uh, Burma CC. And so this is the original link here, Library Lab Law Harvard and so on. And just for fun, I added a daytime to that link. Something like, well, I accessed this and alive, of course, right? And I put the date in 2010 uh, in this page. And so, well, if I click this link, as usual, this is the page, the current page, basically, that I receive. Now I right click on the page and have this option, get at page date. And that means that we're going to get something from some archive. And this is from archive of this. Now the page date was September 22nd, and the best that we get is June 21st. So this is one of these examples where there's not a great coverage of archived material. We don't have a lot of snapshots. Then I'm saying get that link date. And remember, that's the date that I faked in there, the 2010 date. And now again, we use the Memento protocol, and we arrive at the version actually very close to what I was asking for, September 18, 2010, from uh, the Internet Archive. So basically, the bottom line is by adding this little information that we have really available you know, at the moment that we reference and so on, a link can not only lead to the current representation of a resource, but it can basically lead to many different times and many different archives. And I really understand that we need some kind of a change in the infrastructure to make that happen. But I think this is better than painting yourself, as David said also, you know, in the corner of one kind of uh, dependency on the survival of one uh, instance, one archive. That's what we have to say. Thanks all.